This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, along with Jess Matt, and she is in for Tim Stenovic on this Friday. Is it Friday, Jess? I think it's Friday. It, it is. It's it been a long be. week. I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, folks, everybody in that control room, we're leaving after this show. I'm just telling you. We're counting it at Friday. Um, it is Friday, of course. It's just been a busy, dense week. We have, though, a really interesting next segment coming up because, you know, Jess, earlier this year, uh, McKinsey came out, the, the, of course, the consulting giant, and they wrote about quantum technology. And they noted, and this is a quote, quantum computers represent a completely new approach to computing. And while they won't replace today's computers by using the principles of quantum physics, they will be able to solve very complex statistical problems that today's computers cannot. And quantum computing has so much potential and momentum that McKinsey has identified it as one of the next big trends in tech. Quantum computing alone, just one of the three main areas of emerging quantum technology could account, Carol, for nearly $1.3 trillion dollars in value by 20. 35. So do you think we've got everybody's attention now? I think we do. Care? All right, so let's get into it. We welcome Raj Hazra, President and CEO at Quantinum. I hope I'm saying it correctly. There's a lot of yous in there. Uh, he's with us on Zoom from Portland, Oregon. Um, Raj, nice to have you here with us. Say the name of your company. I want to make sure we've got it correctly. It's great to be here. Um, and it is, you got it almost 90%, right? It's Quantinum. Quantinum. And yes, there are a couple of E's in there. <laughs> okay. We want to make sure we had it right. Listen, I'm so glad that we have you here. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about what your scientists and your team and your company are working on. What's the mission? What's the core business? You put Quantinum is the world's largest full stack hardware plus software quantum focused company. We have only one singular focus, and that is to accelerate quantum computing technologies and its commercialization to solve, as you were noting just now, uh, some of those society's largest challenges around inside generation, around cybersecurity. It is the next big thing because it, it is what's going to cause the next big value to society and value in economics. So and our job is to future in. So help me out here, because we're all saying the next big thing in technology is AI, artificial intelligence. Is there a connective tissue between AI and quantum technology? Or are they, are you, should we be thinking about them as two different things or highly connected? Absolutely not. You hit it on the head. AI is a huge force. Think of it as an algorithm set. Think of it as a methodology. Think of it as, as working on data. The key to it is what infrastructure does it run on? Um, so if you note, AI is all about data. More data every day, you know, GPT, three, four, five, the training models are getting huge, lots of data. What, and it's going to run into, and it's running into two specific challenges. How do you compute with this vast amount of data in a sustainable and efficient manner? And number two, which I think you've, you've seen uh, quite a bit in, in recent talk about AI being trustable by being interpretable and transparent. That is the decisions it makes. How do you know it's right? How do you know it's the right thing? Um, so quantum computing is very relevant to both. There are places in classical AI techniques today that quantum is a better way to compute from either data storage perspective or data sh you know, comp compaction perspective or just the raw processing of it. And the more exciting part of it is quantum allows things like languages to be represented in these models in such a way that you can actually make them transparent and interpretable, that you can say why you know exactly why it made the decisions and told you what answers it did. And that is huge because it not lets those kinds of AI techniques be brought into the realm of regulated industries. Imagine it's not just chat GPD, you know, helping you write an email to your friend. It is chat GPT or la large language models making large decisions in industrial workflows, in, uh, in banking, in finance, in linguistics of you know, trying to decide what RNAs and DNA modeling can do. So the, the application is huge for AI to benefit from 
quantum computing as the next generation computing infrastructure that not only makes it more powerful and efficient, but also makes it interpretable and transparent, thereby making bigger use of it for society. You worked at Intel for about 25 years, and when you were there, you obviously also were incorporating AI and machine learning there that really helped revitalize Intel's growth after obviously a prolonged period of decline there. What did you learn from what when it came to AI, and how are you going to end up utilizing that in your role at this point? That's a great question. As you noted, I was at Intel for 25 years, and what we saw, the growth of classical computing, CPU, or central processing unit based computing, dive, you know, expand to heterogeneous compute, where you had accelerators for various workloads. AI was an emerging workload. And what, we, what I learned was there is, you have to do a few things in order to successfully deliver the customer expectations. You have to build the right infrastructure for the right workload. Number two is you have to work with the software industry or the software portion and not just build hardware and build them in lockstep. So there's a complete solution available. There isn't just a hardware asking for software to be written for it. And the third thing is what, what, what we learned is patience in adoption and patience and integrity in stating what the results are, are fundamentally important. So you don't create a hype cycle that collapses on you. That is exactly what I bring to Quantinum. We are working on innovative hardware, but we are a full stack company and we are developing hardware and software in concert so we can actually build solutions for our customers. I'll give you an example. Just last week we announced that names like Airbus and BMW are working to incorporate quantum technology into their standard workflows that exist today to look at next generation fuels or what's called new energy. They're using quantum computing technology from us, working with us, both our hardware and our software to look at better ways and more efficient batteries and, and fuels of the future. That's something they cannot do with classical computing for very long, if at all. So yeah. the, the lessons learned are customer relationships, early and closed relationships between hardware and software and working together to build out true economic use cases. All right, well listen, we're gonna have to continue this conversation at another time. We have run out of time, but we really appreciate it. Continuum CEO and President Raj Hazard joining us from Portland, Oregon. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week, and this is Bloomberg Radio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. All right, guys, we are going to wrap up. We're not quite done. We still have a couple of hours here on Bloomberg Business Week, but I do feel like we, we started the week and just... We several times came back to what was one of the big stories. Yes, the move that we saw along the U.S. Treasury curve and really among global sovereign uh, debt, if you will, in terms of yields moving up. But China, every day there was a stack of uh, new headlines. There definitely was, and especially because this is the world's second largest economy behind the U.S., and then obviously the third one is Japan. But this is really crucial to see how that economy, if it, you're seeing particularly, mm -hmm. especially this year, is supposed to be this big rebound year for the economy. What does that mean when you have different trajectories for both of their central banks? It's been tough going, and we have saw that in certainly the economic data points, the deflation fears, a weakening housing market, a crisis in the shadow lending sector, uh, so much a surprise rate cut. So let's get to it. Uh, Shazad Kazi is back with us. We're so delighted. He's got a report out, a new note, and he asks, is China starting to collapse? Shazad, of course, is managing director at China Beige Book International. They were founded over a decade ago and really to work with and help institutional investors and corporate CEOs navigate China's you know, notoriously black box economy. That's how they write it on their website. It's so well said. He joins us uh, on this Friday afternoon. Shazad, the report. You ask, is China starting to collapse? Is it, or is that just ridiculous? No, China is not collapsing at all. Uh, the market is just so disappointed at the way 2023 has unfolded. They were expecting a big boom basic recovery. Um, we always argued that was very unrealistic. That has not happened. And so the, the investor in community has settled on the narrative that China is on the verge of collapse. And the only thing that can save the day now is big bank stimulus. We, of course, 
argue back and push back against that whole thesis. What's been the catalyst to prevent us seeing a bigger rebound here in China's economy since so many people were expecting that to happen in 2023? I think some of the assumptions going into 2023 were just misplaced. You know, we had two years of a very bad economic shock because of zero COVID policies and, of course, the deflating of the property bubble, which really, um, uh, you know, uh, not only destroyed household wealth, but really crushed consumer confidence. So expecting the Chinese households to come strongly into 2023 and spending left and right uh, was very, very unrealistic. Um, Couple that with the fact that, you know, there is slowdown on the, in the external environment for China, uh, as reflected in its, in its export orders, as seen through, you know, sort of the manufacturing recession, if you will, that we're seeing uh, take place in Europe. Uh, we're certainly seeing pretty, you know, slowdown in manufacturing out here in the United States. Those are starting to add on. And of course, the critical thing, the property market, which is in a multi-year restructuring phase um, and will be a problem story, I think, for the Chinese economy for several more years to go. Just uh, forgive me. I mean, Shazad, go back to what you said. Did you say what did you say about the big banks in China? What was needed? Um, the idea right now, the consensus is that, you know, China needs to unleash big fiscal stimulus projects, the kind that they did in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and only can big bang fiscal stimulus save the Chinese economy. Um, but that's not going to happen. Chinese policymakers are looking to de-risk the system. They want to bring down this whole, you know, this over leveraged problem that they have in the economy. Uh, they're not going to, I think, add further fuel to fire. So then what? OK, <laughs> so it's great that it's kind of contained domestically. All right. Uh, or at least how you're seeing it. But I mean, if if what's needed is not going to be done, then what's, I mean, you know, I think we talked with you earlier in the week, like what do we need to, in terms of a reset, think about the China growth engine? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as we discussed the other day, first of all, investors need to understand that they're looking at a structural slowdown in China. They're looking at the economic management of the country, depart from the model that they're used to, where we, we used to get high rates of growth, um, now China is actually paying the price for some of it. Mm -hmm. The political leadership in China has decided that they have the appetite to pay the political price because they see it as short-term pain and a much, you know, their long their their time horizon is a lot longer than the markets and investors, I think. And and they're willing to pay the price today in order to set the economy on a more healthy, sustainable pace of growth, even though it's going to be a much slower pace of growth than anybody, I think, anticipated. Anticipated China hitting, you know, they're going to potentially do five percent this year. We're looking at sub five percent for sure moving forward. Uh, maybe even one percent or, or no growth down the line if things continue to deteriorate and they're unsuccessful at transitioning the economy. All right, not apples to apples, but is this kind of akin if I think about Paul Volcker when he had a rain in inflation in the seventies? Like he had to do something that was going to make it very uncomfortable, but was going to put the U.S. economy on the right trajectory. Is that kind of where China is, and it's kind of the responsible way of? you know, managing your economy? Within the property market and the way they deflated the bubble, um, I agree with that completely. Uh, they, you know, pain, it has to be endured because that's what happens when you deflate bubbles. Uh, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. And this year, I think, is a great example of the fact that they haven't jumped in to do massive bailouts. The last two years, they haven't done massive bailouts. Um, so I think that's indicative of the fact uh, that they are willing to put the economy on the right track and to avoid what could potentially have been a much worse hard landing. We may, I think, have gotten the Chinese hard landing that everybody predicted this whole time over the last couple of years with the Evergrande crisis and the property crisis that we've seen. Have you seen any sort of red flags brewing when it comes to their property market? I mean, this year has been, you know, a, a very disappointing story for those who bet on the fact that property was on on a, on a steady road to recovery. You know, you're getting sales weakness, you're getting price weakness. Anytime you see an improvement in the numbers, it's not at all sustainable. And it may very well just be the fact that year over year results are so distorted this year, given the on again, off again uh, switch that the economy was put on last year. Uh, the property market and specifically the residential uh, uh, market, the housing market, um, you know, has, I think, a lot more disappointment ahead, sort of like a one step forward, two steps back type of scenario. Uh, we'll see what happens, by the way, on the commercial real estate side of the economy, which oftentimes will escape attention. The commercial property developers are also suffering, as we've seen in China Beige Books uh, numbers over the last couple of months.
All right, so I'm thinking about our audience who, just like the rest of us, over the last couple of weeks are feeling a little, you know, overwhelmed by all of the headlines coming out of China. As you say, China is not starting to collapse. And maybe, and, and what's going on is really kind of the responsible thing in terms of getting the Chinese economy back on track. So what should we keep on our radar? And just got about 40 seconds. So uh, don't fall for the China's Lehman moment story. It's not happening, as we said. Uh, if there is a larger crisis that begins to brew, I would expect more policy support uh, and banks to step in, uh, potentially taking over certain companies and certain projects. Uh, but at the same time, don't go to the other end of the spectrum and start thinking there's going to be big, big bailouts taking place, big fiscal projects being announced. A lot more nuance and sophisticated tracking is needed this time around. But it, there might be st more stuff that goes, that falls down, more bankruptcies, but that's going to be okay just really quickly. We, we will continue to get a mini crisis along the way, absolutely. Uh, I don't foresee this turning into a big Lehman moment. You can get Lehman moments in a non-commercial financial system, which is what you have in China. So great to check in with you. Two times this week, Shazad Ghazi over at uh, China Beige Book International. He's the managing director. Have a great weekend. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We are living in unusual times. Uh, I feel like we do, can't say that enough. Having said that, the macro impacting everything, and that includes crypto, uh, just we had a period of unusual calm in the crypto markets, and that kind of came to an end abruptly this week. The notion of higher for longer interest rates, sparking a sell-off in risk assets, and that included Bitcoin. It led to mass liquidations, a bullish bets, and then there was the Wall Street Journal report about SpaceX writing down the value of its Bitcoin holdings. So it was just a, a lot. lot. There's right? a lot. And then you're also seeing risk assets, like you're talking about when it comes to Bitcoin sliding as much as 8%. So clearly under pressure, and then everybody's still watching that $30,000 um, threshold when it comes to Bitcoin. But we're below it, right? Yeah. Correct. All right. So yeah. let's get to it. Our weekly crypto segment back, uh, or with us, I should say, is Frank Holmes. He's executive chairman at, at the small cap publicly held Hive Digital Technologies. It's a crypto mining company, roughly 321, $321 million in market cap. It's up 163% year to date. He is on Zoom from San Antonio, Texas, from Jess's home state. Yes. Um, Frank, nice to have you here. Happy Friday. Um, how are you? Outstanding in a bear market. <laughs> well, tell us about that. Um, what do you make kind of of the recent trade? It is a bear market, although uh, we're, I guess, what, we're about 60% above where it started the year on Bitcoin. So we have had a pop this year. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely true. But after a brutal sell off last year. Yeah. But what's interesting to me is that the dollar is, is up almost, we do this rolling 20 day uh, standard deviation movement of the dollar versus 10 year government versus gold and versus Bitcoin. And what we're seeing right now going to the Jackson Hole meeting next week is the dollar is up almost two standard deviations. Uh, that's a huge move on the upside. And this week we saw gold break below the 200 day moving average. And naturally yesterday was Bitcoin took it on the chin. And I think these collateral assets are moving in opposite direction direction to the dollar. So I think that that's what we're, we're living with, but I, that's interesting because Carol and I were talking about how that had a correlation with the dollar as well when you're talking about what that means for stock prices too, but for Bitcoin in particular, because earlier this year, especially when it came in um, March, that turned into one of those particular assets that were actually rallying in addition to technology stocks. But I'm curious as far as the dynamic right now between what's happening uh, with Bitcoin and obviously what we're seeing with the bond market at this point. Well, we had the two-year, the five-year, the 10-year, and the 20-year government bond yields all screaming this week. And, uh, and that makes it very difficult for alternative asset classes. Uh, and I think that sort of risk off is, is clearly is the trade right now. And that's part of that contagion. But Bitcoin did take off after Silicon Valley bankruptcy. We did see that. What's interesting to me is that it's not as oversold as it was a year ago in May of 2022 uh, is actually when you look at the elasticity, the movement, the bands of how much it goes up over 20 days versus down 20 days. Uh, it was actually more oversold last year or when FTX blew up. 
Hey, listen, if you can, Frank, tell us a little bit about your business because you guys are certainly, you know, involved in, I feel like, you know, so much that we talk about, whether it's the connection of AI, the Web3 digital transformation. I'm looking a little bit at your website in terms of the things that you guys are involved in. You're operating massive data centers. Are you building new ones? Give me an idea of the business environment and where you guys are spending the most money and the most time and the most effort. The biggest growth is AI, clearly, and we have the most experience. Uh, Hive was the first to use GPU chips and has first actually crypto mining company to ever go public in 2017. And it ushered in many other companies coming into the space. But well, we've been taking our data centers and slowly been building out. And last year we purchased almost $70 million of these high performance NVIDIA chips. Um, and now we're building out the expansion of that. And we see that as much more stable, high profit margin business than actually Bitcoin mining. Uh, Bitcoin mining has these incredible moves to it where your profit margin ex expands dramatically and then all of a sudden it contracts. So our focus clearly uh, for Bitcoin mining, we will double our, our, our our footprint over the next six months. But the real growth opportunity is clearly the reconfiguring of our data centers into AI. Dig a little bit deeper into those numbers for us. So give us an idea of Bitcoin mining, which has been your big business. How much is that still your big business? But give us an idea of the AI side of the business and the kind of growth you're seeing. And does that essentially become the business in three years, five years, 10 years? Like help us out here. You looked at it today, um, it would be 10 million, uh, say 8 million a month, and you're making about 2 million a month. Um, with with um, AI, that number would be uh, making uh, 6 million a month on $8 million. So it's a 90%, 80 to 90% gross margin business. And you're actually less expensive than the AWS or the Google, et cetera. Uh, and so the whole chat GBT has exploded the demand for our A40s, our 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 uh, chips. Who are your clients that are using this mining? It's a great question. We're B2B, so we do not deal with the public. And uh, there are other service providers, even with Bitcoin mining, we do not deal with the public. Uh, we will hold some of our position, that is put it in the bank. Uh, others will sell to turn around and expand the operation. But when it comes to the AI, there are service providers that do all the KYC, AML, do all the, the client ha handholding, and they take a fee off the top for doing that. We provide all the infrastructure and the latest of chips, and they rent basically on an hourly basis. So when you say KYC, is that know your customer? What does that mean? Break it Correct. down for Sorry. folks. Folks, that's Empty okay. Money laundering. When, when you de de right. deal directly with a business, you have to have people on staff that are expertise in anti-money laundering, uh, know your client rules, KYC and AML. That is when you have a B2C business model. Mm -hmm. When you have a B2B, that's not what we have to worry about. That's one reason why I'm a fund manager and, and launching of Hive was, was we couldn't launch a, a Bitcoin ETF six years ago. So we end up co-founding the creation of Hive because we basically mine the coins. We create that right. original coin. But it sounds like you're increasingly moving away from that business because the AI side of it is much more productive. Is that fair? It's it's fair because it was it's two parts. You know, it's a good question um, uh, because we house we're mining Ethereum and Ethereum was a very high margin business, just like AI is. Uh, and so with that, I think the the uh, volatility of Bitcoin uh, will maintain itself. and It'll be a, an ongoing business. But the real growth and big potential are these data centers that we built and own and we continue to expand on and, and the applications that are necessary with these chips that are out there. So I think AI, there's no doubt, is high margin, high growth, and data centers have huge valuations versus crypto mining stocks really don't have the big valuation that AI has. Mm. Are you able to use whenever you're talking about some of the data and tracking your customers as far as inflection points and how that can affect maybe the crypto space and the prices? No, we don't. We really don't get into that. Um, where we use AI would be on 
if you're mining any of the alternative coins in a proof of work scenario, you use AI to maximize your returns, uh, what, what you want to mine. But uh, no, we, we don't. That's all. It's a B2B business model. Yeah, it's really interesting. So CapEx that you guys, data centers are expensive if you're building them out, but we know AI is going to need them. Um, what, are you, what are your expectations for CapEx over the next 6 to 12 months? And are you raising it? Do you feel confident enough to raise it uh, in today's environment? We do. We feel very confident. Uh, we have a strong balance sheet. Uh, we have positive cash flow, even with Bitcoin where it is today. And, and we think that uh, the industry itself is going to go through a big reckoning, the Bitcoin industry, because a lot of the machines that are mining today are not as energy as efficient. And there's going to be what's called a halving next May. And that's basically going to say you're going to earn half the amount of rewards of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is going to have to be over $60,000 right. to cover your costs. So I don't think it's going to work out perfectly for a lot of those inefficient miners. And so we want to make sure that Hive is in a position that we can deal with that. And that's what we've been doing. So our expansion there uh, in, in, in ASICs and along with AI will yeah. probably be in the tune of $100 million. All right. Well, good to check in with you. And Frank, you got a T-Rex behind you, so you better be careful. I think it's a T-Rex. <laughs> it's a red one. Um, it's a red one. It's what? It's a political statement that came out of China by, an art, by a sculpture ah. that China is trying to eat the world. It's a fascinating sculpture. Listen, good to check in with you. Look forward to doing again the, uh, in the future. Frank Holmes, Executive Chairman at Hive Digital Technologies on Zoom from San Antonio, Texas. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive crazy. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, TikTok, everybody. Just about 15 minutes to go until the closing bell. Carol Master, along with Jess Menton, live in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. Uh, as we said, Jess is in for Tim Stanovic, who's off today. And Jess, I'm looking at an equity trade here in the U.S little change, a little bit higher, but we're seeing some buying into the close. Go figure. And now the S&P 500 on pace for its worst week since early August. It had been the worst so who week cares since that we're March, right? Buying, right? So, hey, there we go. <laughs> but yeah, you'd think uh, for a Friday afternoon, but things coming off the lows there for the broader market. Yeah. And if my understanding was volume up a little bit today. Yes, it was. And also you'd think a summer Friday, right? Where volume tends to be lighter. <laughs> I don't know. It's really kind of wacky. And right, we have seen volumes uh, down and I'm looking at the major industry groups in the S&P 500, specifically energy, your outperformers. You've got right. more uh, major industry groups in the S&P 500 actually showing some gains versus those to the declines. Right. And communication services, those are obviously more growth oriented sector that went down close to 1%. All right, let's get to it, guys. The drive to the close with about 14 minutes left in the trading session. Sam Dunlap is with us. He's chief investment officer at Angel Oak Capital Advisors. He joins us on Zoom in Atlanta. Sam, uh, Sam, good to have you here on this Friday. It is an interesting day. We thought, we hoped, we fingers crossed after a rather dense week that it would be a little bit quieter, but that's not the case. How are you thinking about the trade here? Uh, first of all, let's talk about the U.S. market specifically. I think the S&P is on track, as just said. Uh, not a great week, but we're down about three weeks in a row here. What does the reset, it feels like, in U.S. equities tell you? And really the reset, if you will, in U.S. yields? It's definitely, a, in our view, a, a function of yields. You know, where we focus is fixed income and, and not necessarily the equity markets. But I think equities have clearly been under pressure uh, this month and this week, uh, just given the recent rise that we've seen in risk-free yields over the month. I mean, just for August alone, you know, Treasury yields are up four to 35 basis points across the curve. And that's really been pressuring clearly uh, stocks and, and other risk assets here. But we we think it's pretty interesting as an opportunity as, as risk-free yields and, and tenure note yields, for example, have reached the highest level we've seen since 2007. So uh, risk-free yields uh, present a huge opportunity in our view. And, and while you know there may be further room to run here, perhaps at rates on the long end, uh, we think it's a pretty historic opportunity, particularly in areas of of mortgage-backed securities where yields are even higher even in, in government-guaranteed mortgage-backed securities today. 
And so you just mentioned the positioning there as far as what you see in opportunities when it comes to those risk-free type of rates. Where are you shying away from and alternatives that you don't want to necessarily advise clients to buy at this point? Yeah, where we've been focusing is clearly in quality and shorter duration areas of fixed income where you can get these equity-like returns, as I mentioned, you know, with risk-free rates surging to the extent that they have uh, after 2022 and into 2023, uh, you know, investors don't have to take a tremendous amount of credit risk here or even just uh, convexity risk to, to earn, you know, high current uh, yields in the, you know, six to nine percent range. So, you know, we're focusing on higher quality and within the subsectors we focus on in the, in the uh, securitized credit space really focused on mortgage-backed securities here, bonds backed by residential uh, mortgages, uh, but definitely cautious towards areas, for example, uh, within the CMBS space, just given some of the concerns that we have in underlying commercial real estate. I know you're not calling outright for a pending recession in the near term. How do you view the recent batch of economic data that we've seen that shows there's still a resilient uh, consumer out there, especially when you're looking at those retail sales numbers and then hearing from some of the corporates, especially on the retail side with Walmart and others this week. Yeah, the consumer has been extraordinarily resilient and definitely, you know, exceeded our expectations this year. We've been uh, generally favorable towards the consumer, particularly in the post COVID era. Uh, We did start, you know, getting a little more cautious uh, towards, you know, the uh, consumer that's been a little more impacted just due to the inflationary pressures and and the, the lower real wage growth that we were seeing. But that's that's really starting to change, uh, particularly as it relates to inflation coming down. Uh, you know, most recently, we expect inflation to continue to fall, which should bolster real wages looking forward. Uh, so, you know, the consumer has definitely shined. And I would say uh, one thing that market participants, I think, are beginning to really appreciate is just the lack of interest rate sensitivity on consumers' balance sheet, given, you know, typically the largest liability for, for U.S. borrowers is, is the, the, you know, their home. Uh, and the weighted average mortgage rate today is, is around three and a half percent. And the vast majority of that, over 90 percent, is fixed rate. Uh, and I think that's provided a, a tremendous amount of resilience for consumers uh, given the swift pace of, of Fed tightening that we've seen, not only on the front end, but through quantitative tightening. But we, you know, we are growing increasingly cautious given how fast the Fed has gone, uh, and particularly as it relates to asset prices, generally speaking. Uh, but we do think housing is going to be extraordinarily resilient here just amid this recent tightening we've seen uh, really related to, to the stability in the mortgage rates that's, that's bolstering the consumer as well. Hey, where's money flowing among your various uh, investment options? You've got a bunch of mutual funds. As you said, you know, you're really all about yields or the function of yields uh, in terms of investments. You've got an income ETF, an ultra short income ETF. You've got a multi-strategy income fund. Where is the money flowing and what kind of flows? Are we seeing money move out of the safety and security of money markets or perceived safety and security of money markets and where is it flowing if it yeah, that's is a great question yeah you know industry-wide and just across the the uh the bond complex or, or the fixed income complex you really saw a huge amount of outflows in 2022 and you saw a, a nice surge i would say at the beginning of this year from a flows perspective uh you know into uh fixed income but the vast majority of the flows as you well know uh, have really gone into the front end of the bill curve and into money market funds. You know, I think global money market funds are approaching uh, $925 billion on a year-to-date basis. So the, the vast majority of, of global investors are still hiding out on the front end of the curve. Uh, but we think, you know, we are definitely in the camp that we are at or near peak policy and, and, and encourage investors to really consider uh, extending duration uh, in both, you know, you high think quality you're at peak policy, product. even though the world is kind of thinking about a reset of, you know, we were just talking with our Michael McKenzie that right. maybe that 2% inflation just doesn't make sense. Maybe it's more like a 3% inflation world. Do we need to start kind of embracing? Are you guys embracing the idea that maybe it's a different higher reset when it comes to inflation? And that means maybe a different, different investment think. 
you know, perhaps over the medium term, I think in the law in the near term, though, you know, we expect inflation to come down pretty significantly towards uh, the latter part of this year and into into 2024 is the shelter component of, of the of the inflation data continues to roll over pretty hard is, you know, it's been very well publicized. It's definitely a lagging part of the inflation component. Uh, and we're seeing rents falling very fast. And obviously, home prices have come off the, the recent highs that we experienced after COVID. So as that shelter component really filters into the, the, the inflation data, we think that's going to be very supportive to a, you know, a Fed right. narrative that will be approaching you know, a potential slower growth scenario as we head into end of this year and into early next. Sam, I have to ask, what's the top question you're hearing from your clients? You know, the top question we're to, we're getting is, is why are mortgages generally so cheap in today's market? You know, agency mortgages in particular have gotten a lot of attention, especially on, uh, you know, Bloomberg News and in the headlines recently. And, uh, you know, agency mortgage-backed securities, to give you some context from a spread co- perspective, are at the widest levels versus treasuries that you've really seen since the financial crisis. And a lot of investors are asking, right. you know, what are we missing here? What's going on there? Uh, and in our view, it's purely a function of, of Carol's question on flows. You've seen a tremendous amount of flow into the front end of the curve. Uh, you've also seen banks uh, reducing holdings uh, from, from the highs after, uh, after COVID and right. QE. But you've also seen quantitative tightening implemented in earnest. And it's created a pretty historic opportunity, in our view, towards, towards mortgages and just risk-free okay. assets, generally speaking. All right. Good to get your thoughts on that and so appreciate it. Sam, thanks for finding time for us and have a great weekend. Sam Dunlap, CIO at Angel Oak Capital Advisors, joining us on Zoom in Atlanta. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. On Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.